and we get to worship God. Hello! <laughs> I'm aware. Did you have a Is it vacation? It is December. It's like the, what is the, the what is it, the, the 19th? 19th of December already. Yeah. How did we even get here? I don't know about you. <laughs> Any first timers in the house, please raise your hands. Yay! Wow! <laughs> welcome. You are so welcome. Are you holiday goers? Are you here from <laughs> other. Who comes here the first time now? Yes, yes. Thank you that you are And everyone online, welcome. Please tell us in the chat where you are from. It is amazing to, um, to know that you are viewing from all over the world, and it's always exciting to see where it is. Uh, but welcome, everyone that is here. Uh, we, we wish you a Merry Christmas <laughs> and a Happy New Year. It rhymes. <laughs> it does, it does. Goeiemorgen, good morning everybody. Welcome to church. It's great to have you here. I'm Heinz. This is my beautiful wife, Aletta. If you haven't met us yet or know who we are and why we planted a church, uh, we are still a young church. We're just, uh, just over a year now and uh, we are so excited to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Uh, know that you are loved by God, loved by us, and we are grateful to have you here. Um, I, I just want to extend my wife's shout out to those who watch online. Um, I've been amazed at the testimonies and the feedback we've been getting. So to all the people, especially in the United States, that get up at 3 a.m., uh, thank you so much for joining us. We are in awe. And Amen. the testimonies of what God has been doing through this ministry online in your lives, it just blows my mind, and I'm so grateful. And uh, there's, there's a lady that has also contacted us from Pakistan. Wow. says her and her daughters uh, are in a heavily Muslim area. They got saved, and they listen to these messages for inspiration. Um, we have stories of people from other African nations, Europe. Uh, it's really amazing that mm. what God is doing through this little uh, congregation here uh, on a global scale. So we are grateful and we, we, we thank you and let's give God a big praise Amen. shout for that. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, but nothing beats the in-person in gathering. Um, yes. That is what we are told in the Bible. Do not neglect the gathering of the saints. And um, I'm so glad that you guys are here. We are, we are privileged and grateful for that. Um, please follow us on social media if you haven't done so yet, especially for those who are new here. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram. You can go follow Love Key Church and stay in the know. We also have uh, the, the Spotlight Social app as you can get onto. That's a cool way to communicate and be updated. We would love for you to subscribe to our podcast, and it's not just to get more uh, viewers and <laughs> more reviews. We really believe that this is a way for you to go back, listen, make sure that the teaching is, is, becomes part of who you are and that you apply what we have been teaching here. So please go and subscribe and write a review for us and share with other people, friends and family, so that we can get these messages out to as many people as possible. Especially if you've joined us new, become a member new. I would love for you to go back and listen to the Foundation Series, the Impact Series. Those are very, very important. Um, today, and with most of our services, you can follow along on the Uversion Bible app. So you can get the Uversion Bible app, go to events, and search for Love Key Church, and you'll find today's message, and you can follow along, make your own notes, and even in that way, just make sure that these truths become a part of who you are. All right, we love celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Do you have any birthdays or anniversaries from the last week? Anyone? Yes, Ooh, Michael. Wow. Yes, awesome. Anyone else online, let us know if you're having a birthday or an anniversary. Let us sing for Michael. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Come on, beautiful. May you have a blessed year, brother. So glad you're part of our family. All right. We love doing church, and we believe that when God planted this in our hearts, He gave us a mission. And that mission is to help people to encounter God, align with His purposes in order to reign in life and help others to do the same. And if you see yourself being a part of this, we've already gained more than 80 official members praise Jesus and we want all of our members to be a part of what this church is and what God is doing and on that note I just need to say to those of you who have filled out 
an offer to serve and we haven't gotten back to you with like here's specifically what you can do i apologize we are working on getting all of that stuff in order especially for the new year so don't give up on us we are in planning phase and we want everyone to have a role to play in this local church and if you do want to give us an offer to serve you can do so when you register for a service or you can just send us an email or come and chat to us we would love you to be a part of what god is doing here all right we want to ask you and thank you at the same time for praying for us uh, please keep doing so we are very much aware that when we do what we are doing we are not just you know putting up a show and doing church we are seriously taking ground for the kingdom of god and we need your prayer support and we, we need each other's prayer support so we want to ask you to please do so for me my wife my family for this ministry pray for your br brothers and sisters and um I, I skipped the part of the connect groups we want you to join a connect group as well and that's also the people that you can pray for is those that are in your connect group and uh, we're going to kick that off again in the new year but in the meantime you can see who those leaders are and connect with them and when we start up again in the new year you can join one of those connect groups i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart as we come to the end of this year for partnering with this ministry for those of you who have been faithfully diligently generously partnering with us we want to thank you so so much it's been amazing to see how god has just taken seed a uh, good seed in good soil and and made a, a wonderful harvest out of it so thank you for doing that i want to invite you to keep doing so we've got a little red box we're going to pass around the room you can uh, partner by giving cash there's a snap scan and zapper code on the side you can use if you are online or watching this later there are banking details that you can use on our site and on the screen so please there's more than enough ways for you to partner our our request is that you will ask god what should i do how should i partner with this ministry and be obedient as the holy spirit leads you that is the only request we ask of you. If God has put you here as a member, then this is the storehouse where you bring your tithe, where you bring your offering, and where you sow generously. That is the biblical pattern, and we want to invite you to do so as God leads you. Amen? And I want you to know that, especially if you're here for the first time or still recently with us, to know that uh, you know, we have put, told you our values. We want you to know when you do partner with this church, the funds are going for the reaching of more people with the gospel message. We have a heart to positively impact marriages and families. We, we strive to promote unity in the body of Christ. We want to play a role in eradicating fatherlessness. We want to shine a light on the crisis of cultural Christianity. Too many people walk around thinking they are Christians, but they haven't actually gotten saved. And we have a heart to reach those people. We want to sow into a social justice project. And I want you to know that this church uh, partners with organizations that are spreading the gospel in the Middle East, especially in Israel. And, uh, and we tithe to them. And then also, we are still trusting God for a new venue. We're trusting Him that in the er early in the new year that we will have a new space we can call our own. Where we can, and the setup team says, Amen, Hallelujah. <laughs> So we can set up once <laughs> and leave it there. That would be amazing. Um, can we just give our setup team a big round of applause every Sunday, faithfully serving? Thank you. But we would love to invite you to join in getting ready for the new venue by contributing specifically to the new venue fund. You can just do an EFT to our uh, bank account with the reference NVF, and we'll know what that's for. Also, we have a benevolence fund, which is for the people in our church that may be going through tough times and need some help, need some support, we use the benevolence funds for that. Um, and the same thing, if you do an EFT, just mark it with a BF because, you know, this church is your best friend forever. Um, all right, last one. We just want to ask, oh, sorry. I have to tell you about the next service. Our, ne our next service is also our last service for this year. We are having a Christmas service on Christmas Day, the 25th of December. That's Saturday, next week Saturday. Very important to note, we are not starting at 10 a.m. We are starting at 9 a.m. Because most people will have some kind of thing in the oven and a plan for lunch. So 
we, we want to start early so we can finish a bit early, give people space to do their Christmas celebrations. But we want to invite you all to join us next Saturday at 9 a.m. We're going to sing some Christmas songs. We're going to dive into the Word. And I feel that God has a, a very important message for us to learn from the life of Joseph and Mary and how we can apply that to our lives as we look at the, the, the fact that Jesus was born, the fact that He came to earth to become a human, to be our salvation. And we're going to celebrate all of that. So please join us for that. You can register now already on lovekey.churchcenter.com. It's all there. Wonderful. Uh, last announcement. We just, we, I think all of us can agree that the world is heading in a, not a better direction morally, but worse and worse. And we see that specifically in what is being offered up as entertainment. And we have partnered with the Truth TV platform and we want to invite you to to bring this into your home and rather bring wholesome well-vetted family entertainment into your home um, this is a amazing tool to do that there's some great content for kids there's great movies there's educational stuff and uh, you can go to the link that's on this post right now there's a link to truth tv that you can follow or you can just check out um, on our social media as well for that link and you can go and sign up through that we would really appreciate that and we believe that it can be uh, an amazing make a good contribution to your home all right who wants to praise the lord this morning let's do this let us stand to our feet let us read a scripture from the word of god the scripture that I have for you is one that's also going to be part of our, our sermon today. We're going to speak about a message called All Things, and it's how everything belongs to Jesus. And when I read the scripture again, I was just overwhelmed by how powerful it is. So I wanted to make it our, our worship scripture as well. So you will hear it now and hear it later. But I want these words to really speak to your spirit being right now as we read it. This is from Colossians 1, verse 15. He, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have the preeminence let's praise jesus he is the reason we sing Amen. come on church let's put our hands together for jesus it's good to be alive
Oh, this is the reason I sing For the hope that you give And the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for
Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Yes, you reign.
We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for this moment we can be in your presence. Lord, we pray that we can have an encounter with you today. Lord, we choose to make our hearts good soil to receive the truth of your word. I pray right now, Lord, that you will just come and touch every heart, touch every mind, touch every life in this place. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and do a supernatural work in our lives. We're expectant. We're expectant of what you want to do today. Lord, we dedicate this whole time to you, this whole service. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you, Father. Turn to someone and say, Jesus loves you, and you look great today. Jesus. Amen. Did you enjoy that time of worship in God's presence? Anyone? Yes. Five of you? Three of you? Can we get more hands? Come on. Thank you. My wife had a great time. Thank you, Jesus. We're in the house of the Lord. It's, it's hot in the house of the Lord today. Nice and warm here. Those watching from overseas, you may be thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> we have summer Christmas, not winter Christmas. Uh, we've got Kids Church, um, the lovely Bianca will be leading Kids Church for us today. So those of the kids who want to pop to the back there and join Bianca for Kids Church, you are more than welcome to do that now. All right. She has something very special prepared for you guys. You don't want to miss out. <laughs> Just be very nice to her. Okay. Man, it's good to be back. Last week I was in uh, Secunda at this time at a church called Lighthouse Church, and it was, it was great being there. It was great being with that family of believers who are doing an amazing work in that city. Um, but two things. Someone said, West is so much prettier, and I really missed you guys, and I'm so glad I'm back. <laughs> it was a privilege to be there, but I'm, I'm glad I'm back. And uh, hello to everyone there as well. And I just want to say from my side, thank you to Javi de Lange and to Gert and the team that helped out last Sunday. We really appreciate you guys. As many of you will know, we've been in a series called Rain in Life. And uh, our main text, who can tell me what our main text has been? I've been reading it weekly for nine weeks, so you should know it by now. What, okay, what book of the Bible does it come from? <gasps> That's shocking. Niemand let open die klaas nie. What is the main scripture for the Rain in Life series? Anybody? Yeah, you, jy krip nou daar. Mooi. Romans what? 5.17. Okay, church, say after me. Romans 5.17 is our scripture for Rain in Life. All right. So it says, in the New Living Translation, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and His gift of righteousness for all who does what? Who receives it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. If it's your first time with us, you need to know that we are a Bible-believing church. We believe the Bible is the Word of God, and we believe that the opinion of man is supplementary, does not mean as much or more than the Bible. 
We believe that we should be led by the Holy Spirit as we study the Word of God, and we should take it for what it is. If it makes us uncomfortable, that's a good thing. If it doesn't make you uncomfortable, you may be reading it wrongly. <laughs> we are supposed to grow. We are supposed to be challenged. Amen? Are you ready to get into the Word of God today? Because we are going to read a lot of scriptures. It's going to be awesome. But I want to ask, I want to start with a question. I want to ask you guys, is it possible for you to give something that is not legally yours? In other words, if you're not the legal owner of something, can you just give it away to someone else? No. Amen. Okay? You cannot give legal possession of something you do not legally own. You would only be passing on a stolen thing, committing fraud, and implicating the person that you gave it to as well. They will also get into trouble, right? Let me ask you this as well. On the other side, can you possess something, take ownership of something that someone has made legally available to you if you don't actually take it? If you do not accept transfer of ownership, if you do not receive it, it remains something that was given but not taken. Would you agree with that? Okay. Do you guys remember when the postal service used to work in South Africa? Do you remember that time? We used to have a postal service. We did. We no longer do for those listening from overseas. We won't go into the why. <clears throat> well, when it did work and someone sent you a package, what did you get in your post box? You didn't get the package. You got a, a little note, all right, a little slip that says, you have a package. But if you don't actually, and this happened to me a lot, if you don't actually make the time to take the note, go to the post office and get the package, it's just going to stay there. You won't take ownership of it. All right. Do you guys understand? Are we on the same page? Today, we are going to look at what Jesus possesses legally and what he has made available to those who love him, obey him, and are known as his children. And we are going to trust Holy Spirit that he's going to reveal to us how we can take hold of this truth in order to uh, to take hold of what Jesus has given us and how we ought to then apply it to our lives. Do you understand? So we are going to try to not be the people who gets the slip that Jesus has something for us, but we never go and actually take it. That's what we're going to do today. Our message title is All Things. We will read the main scripture that, where that phrase comes from, and then I'm going to show you many other scriptures where the same phrase comes over and over and over again. And I'm, I want you to, once again, I want to invite each and every one of us to choose to make our hearts good soil for the seed of the Word of God. Are you ready? Is your heart good soil? Anybody? You've got to preach with me. Like Harvey said that last week, you've got to preach with me. <laughs> I truly believe that this Revelation has the potential to change us all and take us much deeper in our understanding of who we are in Christ and how we should be reigning in life. We are actually called to rule and reign and take dominion in this world. Amen? Come on, Christians, sol Christian soldiers, soldiers. Oh, man, that takes me back. That takes me back to a very embarrassing story. <laughs> So, sorry, my boy is making jokes in the background for those going here. Um, I want to tell you a funny story that's completely not related to this. But when I, read, when I thought of Christian soldiers, um, I was in my first year, I went on an outreach to Swaziland. And we were roughing it. I mean, it was, we were sleeping in one hall, all of us in sleeping bags on a very hard concrete floor. And each, every day we would go out to schools in the area and do a little music and play thing for them and try to, you know, give them the gospel message. 
And at this one school, they were singing a song that I had never heard before at that stage. But apparently it's quite famous for a lot of people. And it's, it sings, it's about, I am a winner in Christ my Lord. A winner I will be if I am in the Lord. Like a soldier in the army. <laughs> it goes on like that. So the soldier thing is what triggered me now. And at the one morning, I woke up on this cold, hard concrete floor, and I sat up, and the, the whole team was around my sleeping bag laughing and rolling on the floor. And I was like, what is going on? And they said to me, in the middle of the night, I sat up straight in my bed in my sleep, and I started singing, I am a winner in Christ. And then I just, and I just fell back down and slept further, but I woke all of them up. <laughs> Anyway, so I, you can see I still remember that song. Anyway, I'm a winner in Christ. Amen? It's good, those songs. My wife would even tell you how she remembers some scriptures. It's from songs. Songs are powerful ways to remember scripture. Anyway, we're going to look at three main things. We're going to look at how these scriptures are going to show us what Jesus received. We're going to see what Jesus has then given us access to. And we're going to talk about what we should do with it. Because what is, what, it, it is of no use to receive something if you don't actually use what it's made for. Would you agree? Good. All right, so we're going to take this. We're going to see this is our main verse, but you'll see how beautifully our worship scripture from Colossians also ties into this. I'm going to repeat that one. Are you ready for a lot of scripture? The word is going to change your life. Let the Word speak to you right now, because we're going to go into a lot of it. John 13, verse 3 to 5. This is such a beautiful scripture. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, and, this is something you also knew, and that He had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. How many of us, when we know we have a billion dollars in the bank, will with that knowledge go and serve in the lowliest of positions. That is what Jesus did. But the focus I want you to see here is that even before his crucifixion, he knew that the Father had given. It's past tense. He has already received all things. Amen? Matthew 28. I want you to focus and listen and hear in all these scriptures, what does Jesus have? Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me, where? In heaven and on earth. What authority? All authority. John 1, 3. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1.16, this is our worship scripture as well. For This is so good. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Listen to this. Visible and invisible. The spiritual realm was created by Jesus and through Jesus. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, those are the same words we get from Ephesians 6 when it speaks about the armor of God and the spiritual battle. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Can everybody say all things? All things. All things. All things. Now with passion, all things. all things. Come on. Ephesians 1, verse 15 to 23. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, 
Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of of His power toward who? Those who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him where? At the right hand in in what place? The heavenly places where? Far above what? All principality and power and might and dominion and Every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Can you see why this message is called all things? Hebrews 1. Verse 1 to 4, God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He, the Father, has appointed heir of all things through whom Also, he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Yo! Whew! That is what Jesus has received. Because of his death, burial, and resurrection, and because God the Father saw fit that He must receive it. Now, what have we received? The Bible tells us in these next scriptures we are joint heirs of Jesus Christ. We have received an inheritance. We have received authority. We have been made fruitful. Look at this, Romans eight seventeen. And if we are children of God, then we are heirs of who? God and joint heirs with Christ. If, this is a very important if, you must hear this one, eh? you must go down into your heart. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Ouch. Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 6. Blessed be the God, and this is a part that was before the one I just read in Ephesians 1. But see how this ties together. Because this speaks about what we received, and then later down it, it explains what Jesus has. So I'm just flipping it around. Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing from where? The heavenly places in whom? Christ. Just as He chose us in Him when? Before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and what? Without blame. Before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by 
Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Yo, this is huge. 2 Peter 1, verse 3 to 4. As his divine power has given us, given to us all things that pertain to what? Life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which, ha- by which have been given to us what? Exceedingly great and precious promises. That is what we've received in Christ Jesus. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We did a sermon on this not so long ago. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How can Jesus give it to us if he doesn't have it? He has the keys to the kingdom, and he's saying, I'm giving it to you, my people, my children. John 15, 7 to 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then only you will ask what you desire because now your desires are lined up with God's desires and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. John 15, 15, just a few verses lower down in that same passage. No longer do I, Jesus, call you disciples my servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father. I have made known to you. Can we give Jesus a praise offering for these amazing scriptures? I need some water after that. Because of the fall of man, the law of God requires an appropriate sacrifice. Only Jesus could be the necessary ultimate sacrificial lamb that could satisfy the wrath of God and pay the price once and for all. And because Jesus did this, he receives all things from the Father. All things are for the Father to give since he created all things. God can legitimately give Jesus all things because he made all things. Do you agree? Amen. The first Adam caused division between man and God and God's original plan for mankind to receive all things that he had for them did not work out initially like it should have. God's original plan was for man to be in this beautiful intimate relationship where they receive all things, eat from the tree of life and live forever with him. That was the plan. The second Adam, Jesus, had to come and fix it all, bring it back into alignment And he so he did by paying the ultimate price, dying on a cross, facing death, being separated from God for a moment. And he defeated sin and death, got the keys from Hades and death, and he rose again. Now, through Jesus Christ, through a relationship with him, something we can only attain by realizing I am a sinner because of the fall, I need a Savior I need to repent, give my life to Jesus, get water baptized, get Holy Spirit baptized, join a local church, and serve the kingdom of God in order, uh, in other words, by getting truly save, saved, we then gain access to the all things. The reason that I explain what a Christian is in so many details is because the definition of a Christian has been watered down to almost nothing. Anyone can just label themselves a Christian. It is important to know that there had to have been a moment where you said, I die to myself. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, I will serve Him. Not my will, not my desires, His desires. Amen? 
It is clear from Scripture that we become legitimate co-heirs of Jesus Christ once we become born again. So that's why it's so important to know whether you really are saved or not, whether you really are born again or not, and whether you understand what it means. If you don't understand what it means, go and listen to our podcast series where we speak about the foundations and we go into repentance and salvation and lordship and all these things. It's important to understand this. By being truly born again, saved followers of Jesus Christ, we then become legitimate co-heirs with Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn of many brethren. We are the brethren if we are truly born again. Through our relationship with Jesus, we have access to the all things we read about. Amen? The question is, do you believe it by now? You can read it and say amen, but do you believe that you have access to all things? When we step into a relationship with Jesus, we step into a covenant relationship. And we have access to the incorruptible seed that made Jesus the firstborn of many brethren. And we have access to the covenant God made with Abraham. It is very clear from Paul's writings that we can know this. I won't go into that right now. But because we are in Christ, we have access to the original covenant God had with Abraham. In a covenant relationship, both parties come into it with all that they are. And all that they have. It is 100%, 100%. It's not 50-50. 50-50. It's not. Jesus brings his all. He brings his all things into relationship with us. We are invited to do the same. The only difference is our old all things need to die. So that he can make alive what was the original design for us. And then we bring that into relationship with him. We are invited essentially to lay down the things that we, that we are, that we have, the earthly things, the weak things, the things that we worship in our flesh, the things that are weights and sin in our lives. We need to sacrifice all things. That is the key to receiving the all things that Jesus has. Imagine yourself standing with your hands full of rocks. There's no more space. And someone is standing in front of you and they want to give you diamonds but you don't want to let go of the rocks. Imagine that for a moment. Your past, your sinful self, the dead you, is holding on to stuff that you think has value, but it has no value. And Jesus is standing in front of you saying, let go. Let go of the rocks and receive what I have for you. It's so much more worth. It's worth so much more. If you refuse to let go of worthless things that you think have worth, You cannot receive the priceless things that God has for you. The all things Jesus makes available through covenant relationship is not a lucky packet from which I can now snap my fingers and get all the stuff I've always wanted. It's not a false prosperity gospel slot machine. It is not that. Remember John 15, abide in me and let my words abide in you. And when we truly love Jesus and we grow closer to Him daily and we die to ourselves and our sinful nature, our heart's desires will become more and more the same as God's desires. And then our prayers will change more and more to align with what God wants. Those are the prayers that will be answered. The prayers that are in alignment with God's will. I'm not saying that His will is not for you to receive things. But are you praying out of a selfish place or are you praying out of a kingdom-minded place? Imagine for a moment, you're the sibling and the co-heir of the richest person on the planet. You receive the same things that he had received. You have access to billions of dollars. You have the bank account numbers, and you have the necessary PIN codes, and all the right permissions, and the right people know your face. All right? Imagine that for a moment. But you know, as well, that it's part of a family business. And the family business has a business plan, and a strategy that has been put in place 
and funds can only be used for the furthering of the business purposes. The funds you seek will be released when your request is in line with the family business plan. No wasting allowed. Can you see that? How that is the same? So the question is, do we all know the cosmic and eternal plan, business plan, so to speak, of our Father in heaven? And do we trust that His plan is the right plan? Do we trust that His plan is a good plan? What do you think God's plan is? <laughs> Everyone gets saved. Amen. It's to plunder hell and populate heaven, as Reinhard Bonnke always used to say. Plunder hell, populate heaven. Remember when, I, when we talked about the keys of the kingdom of heaven, how we are actually positioned in an offensive way to breach the gates of Hades, the gates of death, to go and get those who are dead in sin, dead because they don't know Jesus. Plunder hell and populate heaven. Does it take manpower to do this? Yes. In terms of manpower meaning people. We need numbers to reach the millions and billions of lost people. Will it take billions of dollars to reach the lost and bring God's brand of justice and righteousness to the world? Yes, it will. So when we pray and beg and try, but nothing seems to happen, no prayers seem to be answered, is it because God is not good? Or could it perhaps be that we are not praying in alignment with what God wants us to pray? Maybe it's not in alignment with what God has in store or planned. Could it also perhaps be that God is waiting for us to be the change that we are praying for? Remember the sermon I did on David and Goliath? There was a moment where David had to come out of the pasture where he was praying and praising God, and he had to actually pick up a stone, run towards the giant, and kill it with a stone. There was a moment where he had to take action. But he had the hours and hours of spending time with God as well. And he had the testimony of the bear and the testimony of the lion. He took action early in his life as well. That brings me to the question, what should we do with all things that Christ has made of us? As our main scripture from this series tells us, we get to reign over sin and death. We've received the power in Jesus to reign over sin and death. What does that mean? It means that you don't have to sin anymore. It means that sin has no power over you except the power that you give it after coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You will, yes, there will be temptations, but the Word says you will not be tempted beyond what you can handle, and God will always give a way out. Am I taking the way out? And over death, eternal death. We can reign over eternal death. When, once we are in Christ, we can know that we can bring heaven to earth while we are here. We can experience something of heaven while we are here. We can bring something of heaven where we are, in our marriage, in our home, and we can bring it in our community. And we can know that we are on our way to heaven. Like Jesus in John 13, 3, it says he knew where he, that he came from God and that he was going to God, but there's a mission in between. We have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How many of you can name and number the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places? I can't either. Because it's heavenly and it's spiritual. How many of you would like to find out? Imagine if you could just get five of them. Jesus says we have access to all of them. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And Peter says we have received everything that pertains to life and godliness. What does that mean? Once again, we can reign in this life over death, and we can reign over sin. Godliness means to be like God. 
Secondly, we can reign and rule and have authority in this realm. If Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, why does the world look the way it does? That's a good question. We are reading these scriptures. It says he's got all things, all authority. Why does the world look the way it does? In our own nation here in South Africa, I don't know what it looks like for you in your nation, but I know the States has a high percentage as well. In South Africa, our latest census shows that eight, over 80% of people proclaims to be Christians. 80%. When you read the newspaper, does our nation look like a Christian nation? Is it in line with biblical values and morals? No. So if someone is lying or someone doesn't know what it means to be a Christian or a lot of us that are actually also, that are really born again, don't know the full capacity of what we've been called to. Could it be that something integral we have missed in the Great Commission is to go to all the nations and make disciples of all people, is to make sure that we reach those in positions of authority and, uh, and even choose to be in those places of authority? Is it okay for Christians to only pray and hope from the sidelines and complain when we see unrighteousness and ungodly leaders destroy our nation through corruption and complete lack of biblical morals. That's like when I sit at home and I watch the rugby comfortably in my seat with my heart rate very low, no sweat. I look at the screen and I want to tell Ibn Itzabed how to tackle. Really? But that's what we do. Here, help us, I Mark a verskal. Bring a verskal. Please, Lord, help us. And God is going, yes, go. Be the difference. I've given you all things. And we sit there going, let someone else do it. <laughs> Some missionary somewhere, I'm sure, will do it. If you are a Christian businessman and you're sitting with millions or billions, what are you doing with that money? Are you applying it to the kingdom of God to, to make the difference we need to make? When someone comes to you and tells you about a kingdom-minded idea, do you just shoot it down because it can't have business profitability? Or are you so kingdom-minded that you can see the profit in the kingdom rather than the profit in this world? Is it not perhaps time that we realize that the part of the all things we have received in Jesus is to be His hands and feet? Yes, in our marriages. Yes, in our families. Yes, in our work and community. But what about places of government? Places on school boards? Municipal leadership? Provincial and even national leadership? Why are we not there? Why are people that really love Jesus not in those positions? And if someone is, are we supporting them? Are we really helping them? Are we praying for them, sending money, making it possible what they need to do? Or do they just stand there open for every attack of the enemy like sitting ducks? What are we doing? When we do get into positions of authority, it may come with wealth and power. And we need to be positioned that we never worship that wealth and power, but always God first. But we need to know that if God will test us, if He can trust us with a little, He will trust us with much. That's a biblical principle. But have we even stepped out to be trusted with the little? This year, I've been challenged with this. I'm preaching to myself today. I'm hoping this lands in many other hearts as well. But I've learned this year that I cannot sit on the sidelines and expect other people to bring the kingdom of God in places where I've not put my hand in the soil and I've not plowed and I've not gotten my hands dirty, so to speak. I was very disappointed this year with people that I expected to be gatekeepers and they let me down. But God has shown me, yes, that maybe they did let, let you down, but you weren't there to be the difference either. And that really 
challenged me. And I believe that we need to take these scriptures seriously and ask God, okay, how can I be not just a godly husband and father? Yes, absolutely, we have to be those things. That never changes. But also, how do I change my community? How do I change my town, my city, my province, my country? How do we do that? We can very easily in the church community fall into a trap of false prosperity gospel. And when we, when we see, we have access to all things. But our Jesus is calling us into greater wisdom of what that means and what it looks like practically in our lives. Are we in the end times? Many people are talking about this. Yes, we are. I think that's pretty clear. But we've been in it for a long time. When, when Peter did his first sermon after the day of Pentecost, he quoted Joel, the prophet Joel, that speaks of the end times. And 3,000 people got saved. That's 2,000 years ago. We've been in the end times for a long time. I'm not a... I'm not an expert in this field by any stretch. But I think it's pretty clear that things have gotten to a pressure point, right? How long do we still have? It's not for us to say. Some people are predicting it. My wife believes it's very soon, like five years from now. <laughs> but we don't know. But the question is, what are we going to do with the time that we have? What are we going to do with the time that we have? We do not know for sure. Is the world a mess and will it get messier? Yes, that's prophesied. The Bible said it's going to get worse. So what should we do? What can we do? I believe we should take these promises of the Bible seriously and know that we know that Jesus truly has all things. We need to believe that he does. He has it. No matter what it looks like out there, he does. He has it. And that through him, we have access to the all things that he promises us. We need to start there, just believing the word of God. If every Christian of the 80% of people who say they are Christians believe that Jesus owns all things and that by relationship with him they have all things, that already will change this nation. Amen? We need to apply this knowledge and trust God for wisdom in how each of us can occupy a position a sphere of influence, a position of power, whatever that might be, for the glory of His kingdom, not our kingdom, His kingdom. And it does start at home. It starts with our marriages. It starts with our parenting, our family and our friendship. But it needs to go further than that. We were not created to be superficially happy and live comfortable and convenient lives. That is not what we are called to do or be. If you want that, if you want a happy, convenient, comfortable life, don't follow Jesus. Seriously, don't. It's going to get uncomfortable. You're going to be unpopular. The world is going to scream at you. They're going to insult you. They're going to try and cancel you. Cancel culture. I know what that feels like. No one can cancel a child of God. But you have to know it's not going to be easy. If you don't want that, then go follow the Broadway. Many other people are on it. The end of it is eternal death and separation from God. But for this short time, you'll have a great time just doing what you want. So enjoy that. But if you're serious about living the life God has for you, then you have to make a decision to come on another path. It's called the narrow path. There's much less people on it. And it's hard and it's challenging, and you have to die bit by bit every day. But at the end of it, there's a promise of eternal life with Jesus in the glorious presence of God for the rest of eternity. And I can promise you this from my own experience, even though it may be tough while you are here, if you are truly born again and saved, the, the, the peace and the rest and the glory of God that comes into your life makes it amazing to live even through the trials. And then when the, when the great, beautiful, peaceful times come, it is like it's next level. 
I know I may be selling something that may, sounds to you like, whoa, I don't want to follow Jesus if it's going to be hard. But I also can't sell you a fake gospel. Jesus never told us it's going to be easy when we follow him. In fact, he said, you need to die. You need to pick up your cross and follow me. That's what he said. That the good news is that the part that needs to die is the old self that was heading for hell anyway. You want that to die. And when you come alive in Christ, it's the original design spiritual being that comes alive. And then that you has a personal relationship with God and can bring heaven wherever you go. We have been called to a life of giving our all to the kingdom of God, to praise, worship, and serve God with all that we have and share His love and His kingdom with others. That is our calling. If you're still wondering why you are here, that is your calling. Love God, love people. Know Jesus and make Him known. That's your calling. We have been given all things, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, everything that pertains to life and godliness. We've received it. Now let's use it. Let's take it into our lives and actually apply it. Wake up knowing that this is true. You may need to get up and retrain your mind every day by making a declaration saying, I am a child of God. I have received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and I have received everything that pertains to life and godliness. Therefore, this will be a glorious day. This will be a good day because I'm alive. When you open your eyes, go, oh, yes, thank you, Jesus. I get to live another day to bring your kingdom, to, make, to get to know you more and to make you known a little bit more. Help me to do that. Holy Spirit, where do you want me to make a difference for your kingdom today? Alternatively, you can wake up and start thinking of all your problems and complain. What are you going to choose? What are you going to choose to do? We were called to reign in life over sin and death and to take position for the kingdom in this world. We are not going to make the differences we seek by only praying. That's important. We have to do that. But we need to stay sensitive as to when the Holy Spirit say, go. When they're asking for someone who will nominate themselves and the Holy Spirit says, that's you. Put up your hand. Make the sacrifice. Plan your life so that you can be the difference. Get on that school board that are making horrible decisions on your children's behalf. Get on that municipality. Become the mayor of your town. Whatever it may take, whatever God is calling you to do. I'm not telling all of you to go into politics. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm asking you to step out in obedience, to step out in faith. If you're, called, if you're already a successful businessman, or if God has given you a business plan, is that business or that business plan going to serve the kingdom? We need the billions to change the world. How are you going to apply that? How is it going to make a difference? Are you tithing? Are you complaining about finances while you are not tithing? It's connected. If you start honoring God, He will bless you. That's how it works. We don't tithe to receive, but it's how it works. We tithe because we are faithful. We tithe because we are obedient. All right. I want us to all stand together, please. And let's just reflect and respond to what God has shared with us today. I would like to ask everyone to close their eyes. And I would like to make an invitation to everyone here in this place and everyone that's online. Maybe God, the Holy Spirit, has been speaking to you during the sermon today. And maybe you realize that what you think is being a Christian is not the whole picture or maybe you had a completely other idea. 
Maybe you realize today you're just a cultural Christian. You're just someone who grew up in a Christian home. Or maybe you come from a completely different faith background or maybe even an atheistic or agnostic background, whatever it might be. If you felt something move on the inside of you, that is the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. That is God calling you home. Because as your creator, nothing will satisfy your life like the one who created you can. Only He can fill the God-shaped hole in your heart. Only He can make you new the way that you desperately want to be new. So I want to make an invitation today for anyone that is here in person or online. If you want to choose today to give your life to Jesus, as every eye is closed, I just want to ask that you will slip up your hand so we can see that is you. Or put up a hand in the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone in this place? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. For those who may be online and those in this place that want to give their life to Christ, we're all going to pray together. Pray after me. Lord Jesus, today I choose to give my life to you. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. Thank you that I can be free because of your sacrifice. Today I choose to accept you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you are the Son of God. And I believe that you have set me free. Today I choose to follow you, to do your will, and to die to myself. Holy Spirit, help me, guide me, and lead me. Heal my heart and help me to, come, to become whole. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you realize today that, yes, I've given my life to Christ, but I've been kind of going at it with a half-heartedness, or maybe you've backslidden, and you realize today, man, I need, to, I need to come back to the fullness of following Jesus. If you want to just repent from that today, I just want you to pray after me as well. We can all do this together. Lord Jesus, I repent for not living the, my life for you to the full. Today I commit to give all that I am to all that you've died for. And I choose to receive all things that you have made available. Help me, Jesus, to live in the wisdom that you have given me. Show me where I must lead. Show me where I must be in authority for the furthering of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Lord God, we praise you, we worship you, we honor you, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, for life. Thank you that you've given us all things if we are your children. Thank you that you've given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, that you've given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Thank you that you own all things and we are co-heirs of you. Help us to understand what that means, how that looks in our own lives, and help us to live that out in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for every man, woman, and child, every marriage, every family that's represented here and online. I pray that you will cover them, protect them, anoint them, bless them, strengthen them, surround them with your wall of fire and your angels. And we stand, Lord, on Psalm 91 that says, if we make you our dwelling place, that you will protect our home from pestilence and from evil. We stand on that word in the name of Jesus. And I bless these people, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. Thank you for joining us today. Please stay behind for some coffee and fellowship. Please hang out. Please say hi. We thank you so much for joining us. Please remember to join us next week for the Christmas sermon on Saturday, 9 a.m. We will see you then. 
God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.